Welcome to our safe place where we share the stories of workplace trauma and we offer solutions to help you thrive and to live your better than best life. I'm Andrea Moorhead. Before we begin discussing today's theme, let's take care of a little house cleaning business. I want to first say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much to all of you who have subscribed, you're listening, and you're also sharing this podcast and YouTube show with others. You know, when it comes to social media, I typically don't focus on the number of likes and the shares and the emojis, but my silence is not for sale. It's different. You've most likely heard the phrase, if I just reach one person to help them through this educational and healing journey, then my experiences were worth it. Well, the response to this show has been nothing, nothing short of amazing with over 4,000 views and counting of only two episodes. Translation, potentially 4,000 people are learning what bullying, microaggressions, and gaslighting, what it looks like in the workplace. Also, potentially 4,000 people finally feel they're not alone in this overlooked and often silent problem. And potentially 4,000 people are getting connected to the resources they need to heal from this trauma. That's the purpose of this channel, to educate, create a safe place for these conversations, and to empower all of us to collectively work to solve this problem with improved and perhaps new laws. And the best way for people to fully understand why it's necessary is to hear the truth. Hear the truth of someone's experiences, including my story. My silence is not for sale. It isn't retaliatory or revenge because my faith affirms that God will fight our battles and vengeance is his, not mine. You may not know my parents are pastors and they have been in ministry all my life. And thanks to their teachings and my personal relationship with God, he promises to hold people accountable for their misdeeds. He says, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. While he's doing his job, my responsibility is to actively engage in the healing journey, which included forgiving. But I will never, ever forget. I believe that adversity in life is an opportunity for advocacy, and that's the purpose of this show. Like the people I have covered over my 35-year career, I have a story to share, too. And my silence is not for sale. That's why I rejected the settlement and didn't sign the non-disclosure agreement, so I can add real-life context to this discussion of workplace trauma. In fact, a week before I had to make a decision about the settlement, I went for a walk and I prayed about what should I do? I said, God, what should I do? And he literally told me, don't sign the agreement. He said, I want you to share your story. I told my parents and my husband and Archie said, babe, I know you were never going to be satisfied with anything they offered because you wanted people to know what really, really happened. And you were not one to be silent. And he's right. I really was hoping to parade all of the players, if you will, in court so that you can hear and watch for yourselves the gaslighting, the lunacy, and even lies to see how power and control are maintained at all costs. But that was not God's plan. This channel is his plan. All right, we're done with the house cleaning. That's over, so let's get to it. This will be the second to the last episode of outlining the most egregious behaviors that I experienced. And then we're going to begin to kind of kick up this movement. This is not a moment. Again, this is a movement to jumpstart this movement that all of us need to participate in and to reduce and ultimately eliminate workplace abuse and improve laws to hold companies accountable for failing to protect its employees. Now, this also includes mandating that everyone has access to an independent and neutral body not connected to the employer to conduct the investigation of any abuse and systemic harassment, discrimination, bullying, gaslighting, and microaggressions and more. If you've been the object of any type of harassment, you likely remember every single aspect of the workplace trauma that you've experienced. I know it's etched in your mind as well as your heart forever. I remember specifics like what I was wearing, my facial reaction to conversations with management, the noise in the room, even my eye contact with people in the room who heard and witnessed the egregious behaviors. And of course, those sound bites. I'm going to, in this episode, round out some of my experiences with a few more details. But before I do, if you are a victim of workplace abuse and trauma, really of any sort, some of what I share may be triggering for you. So while listening, please take some deep breaths because I want you to protect your peace in whatever way brings you comfort. Wherever you are in your healing journey, I don't want to re-traumatize you. 
So again, please protect your mental health. This episode is called Triggers. In full transparency, there are times when I feel a little bit of a rise in my voice. I speak a little faster and my heart is beating faster when I share with others some of the unconscionable behaviors that I endured. And I'm sure you'll agree that you never will ever forget as well. Maybe there's a word, a phrase, a gesture, anything can transport us back to those moments of trauma. It's really like reliving it all over again. That PTSD, it's real. There's no escaping the fact that we will likely always have it. Now, all we have to do is learn how to manage it, manage the long-term effects of post-traumatic stress and anxiety. Because none of us asked to tack this on to the laundry list of life's issues and challenges, but here we are. Here are my trigger words and phrases based on my work abuse experiences that when I hear them, my mind instantly goes back to these moments that date back to some 15 years ago and right up to the moment when I walked away on June 5th, 2020. All right, here's the first phrase. It is the worst. The phrase sounds pretty innocuous, right? Well, for me, when I hear someone use this in a sentence about anything, the worst, Nine times out of ten, it takes me back to when I was anchoring the 5.30 show in my earlier years at the station. We hired a new producer who just happened to be a person of color. Now, if you're not familiar with what this role is, the producer is responsible for crafting our newscast. They decide which stories to include. They write the scripts. They arrange where the reporter's stories will align in the show. And they create graphics for the show and so much more. That's just a little bit of it. Well, after about a month of producing, my male co-anchor requested a meeting with our executive producer who manages all of the producers. So it was the co-anchor, the executive producer, myself, and the new 530 producer. The four of us met in a closed-door office. And so I sat with the window behind me, the co-anchor to my left, the executive producer to his left facing me, and the new producer on my right facing the co-anchor. Well, he began to discuss how he wasn't happy with the show, but more specifically, how he was displeased with our new producer. He said with a negative and very controlling tone that will live with me forever. Quote, you are the worst producer I have ever worked with. End quote. To say that I was stunned and shocked is an understatement. I had secondhand anger. I sat there thinking, what do I do with this? I was young. I know the executive producer was equally taken aback, and I looked at the co-anchor, and then I turned my head to look at the producer, and she was visibly upset. Again, I was in my early 30s, and I didn't quite know what to do. The EP immediately began taking or talking, but her voice was drowned out by my pain. I had never heard him speak to any other producer like this ever in my almost two decades of working with this person only her. This set up a tumultuous relationship moving forward because this producer couldn't do anything right for the remaining of her tenure. It was a bitter battle that continued until she was eventually demoted to the weekends and she eventually left. But let me tell you, she's now with one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies. She's thriving. She's winning awards as a communications leader. And though I buried the lead, I knew that she was going to be demoted because I told her. I said, be prepared, because the anchor mistakenly left open on his computer an email complaining about her to management and the other female co-anchor. Mm -hmm. How does an Emmy-winning producer, winner of an Edward R. Murrow Award, be the worst producer that he's ever worked with? I'll let you figure that one out for yourself. And by the way, she wants me to share this story with you. After all these years, she says it was one of the worst work environments and anchor team she's ever worked with. Her silence is not for sale. The same co-anchor was demoted to the noon show while I was on vacation with my husband. When I returned, he wouldn't talk to me. Not on the desk. He was walking around me with passive aggressive energy and made anchoring together very uncomfortable. There was no banter during the commercial breaks, and any attempt by me for small talk was met with silence. Well, finally, after over a week passed, he asked me to speak with him again in the same office before that we were in with the producer and the executive producer, and he attempted to skewer me, if you will, for not asking him 
how he was doing with his reassignment. I sat there and I was stunned. And by this time, I had grown up, these were some years later, and I was able to sit there and confidently say, quote, we don't have a relationship where I'm comfortable asking you or inquiring about management decisions. We're coworkers, not friends. Number two, left out. You may be thinking, well, that's odd. Well, here's the backstory. We had an 11 o'clock PM producer who was one of the best, and she was preparing to move to a larger market. And right around the 10 p.m. time, the co-anchor made an announcement on the loudspeaker for everyone to gather in the newsroom for a goodbye send-off. Treats were brought in by different people, and of course, we were speaking wonderful words about her. And so I sat there attempting to disguise my disappointment because I had no idea that the co-anchor and the weather person had organized the party, and they failed to include me. I talked about it with my mother as I was driving home, and I talked about it with my husband. I was disappointed, but I knew that I needed to share my concerns with him and to not hold it in because I've been holding in my feelings for so long. So I called him at home. This is about 12 o'clock in the morning, 1230. And I had a very honest conversation about having been excluded and how disappointed I was. Well, the next night, the weather person offered me some leftover treats from the party and said, would you like some? Didn't want you to feel left out. At that moment, I knew that the co-anchor had shared my private conversation with her. Now, was she well-intentioned? Perhaps. But this moment, coupled with changing my scripts by this co-anchor, as well as overhearing conversations about me from him to other people in the studio, unbeknownst to him, was part of the fraying of what once was what I thought was a close and respectful relationship. The mental mind games continued during live broadcast as I was not included in the crosstalk to the weather segment. So I mentioned this to the general manager who began watching the shows and specifically asked him to watch these moments. And he acknowledged there was some exclusionary behavior on the set, on live TV. So I moved to the anchor seat. I was told, all right, we're going to move you guys around. So he moved me to the anchor seat between the two of them to create visually a more inclusive and balanced conversation during our crosstalk. But the mental games continued from over-talking to making faces with their eyes. I told him on several occasions, I know what you're doing. And it was just so darn funny to him. It was intentionally toxic behavior on a daily basis. Some may be trying to explain it away and say, yeah, it was just a little ribbing or it was just a little fun time. We're just having a good time. But these mental games on a consistent basis are exhausting. And it does affect your mental health. It doesn't matter how strong you are. And I consider myself to be a pretty strong person. I also overheard him attempting to set up a story with a veterinarian who was giving back to our community through a nonprofit. I had already scheduled it. And I surmised as I listened that the vet told him so that I was doing a story because he said, oh, I don't know anything about that, but my producer wants me to do the story. So I went and told the news director about the situation and his continuation of changing my scripts. And the news director said, well, I can't tell you, but you don't have to worry about him anymore. So I sat there, but I instinctively knew that he was going to retire. About a month later in April, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, and the general manager told me that my co-anchor had agreed to stay until the end of the year while I was out, in and out for treatments, surgery, and the radiation. And the GM said to me, he's such a good guy for doing this for you. For doing this for you. The third word, trigger word, is job. I know. The word job. But every time a new female anchor was hired, including my friend, ABC Weekend anchor Lindsay Davis, he would say to me, they hired her to take your job. All the time. That's what was told. The mental games, they were rampant. Had I not been strong enough in my own skill set as I continued to grow and hone my own craft, the mental games could have been debilitating. Debilitating mental blows. What he and others failed to realize is that I don't compete against people. I compete against myself. So I ignored it, but imagine if this had happened to someone else whose emotional constitution is not as strong. Regardless, these behaviors are toxic and they're wrong. Number four, iPhone. In October 2019, during Breast Cancer Awareness Month, I single-handedly initiated, researched, and produced our station's coverage. In fact, there was no plan whatsoever other than the obligatory mention at the beginning of the month. Well, here's some foundational information. I told the general manager that I was not getting access to photographers to shoot my stories. And he asked me why. 
And I said, that's really a question you need to ask your news director and the executive producers who are responsible for scheduling. Well, the four of us met in a closed door meeting and the GM didn't ask them to explain themselves, but he did make a statement. He said, I don't even know why we're here. I don't understand why we're having this meeting and told them, he said, to make sure that I get what I needed. While the other anchors were readily given access to photographers and scheduling accommodations, producers assisting them with research and writing, I can't think of one time when I had such assistance during that administration. The previous general manager was also informed of the disparate treatment, the lack of access to resources, but the treatment continued. In fact, I had to shoot one of the cancer-related stories on my iPhone. Now, the business has been gradually changing and moving towards reporters shooting their own stories with their own phones. But photographers were made available for the other anchors whenever they wanted, including stories across the border and around the world. Oh, that's right. Their defense as to why I was treated differently was because I came to work unprepared. And photographers were given to reporters and anchors who had story ideas and came to work prepared. And I came to work prepared. Any story that viewers saw never came from or was initiated by a producer. Everything, everything that I did, everything that you saw me produce was my idea, including our breast cancer awareness coverage. And they know it. But again, they lied about my work ethic in depositions, although facts and evidence prove just the opposite. So I shot my story with this, this iPhone, my iPhone. I was given a small microphone by the head of the photographer's department to connect to my iPhone. And the story was shot on a Saturday evening. I was still going through treatments. I still wasn't feeling well, but I believed in the story and I thought it had to be told. On Monday, the video had to be converted and I had to beg the producer who would log video, write and edit stories for other anchors, never for me, to show me what do I do. Now, anyone who knows me knows that I am not technologically savvy, but I sat there, I was bumbling and fumbling around trying to convert the video into our system and also trying to prepare for the 5 p.m. show. I still get anxiety sometimes just thinking about that moment. Number five, hidden camera. Mm -hmm. I created a franchise segment called A Woman You Should Know, and it highlighted the unsung and inspirational sheroes in our community. It used to air during the 5.30 broadcast, anchored by two other people, but it was short-lived. Before it was dropped, when I would present my stories in the studio, the passive-aggressive shade, the cryptic personal conversations and utterances, the eye rolls with one another, the on-air banter was met with me with lackluster camaraderie. I know they thought I didn't see it or feel it, but it was clear I did. It was suggested to me to record their activity with a hidden camera to prove the intentional lack of professionalism. I got the pen, but I just couldn't do it. I kept thinking, this is so ridiculous. Why do I have to do this? So I didn't. But my segment was canceled. I was told because there wasn't enough time to wear it. And I later found out that the anchors complained about me in their show. They didn't want me in their show. The word cough is number six. This is a triggering word for me. The news director and assistant news director would always cough <coughs> as they walked behind my desk. At first, I thought it was random, but I began to notice that they did it all the time. So I wanted to make sure that I wasn't being crazy. The behavior continued, and it was only behind me as they walked by. After the newsroom was rehabbed and my desk was moved, I thought, okay, maybe this was just in my head, but it continued only when they walked behind me. So I went to HR and I explained the scenario and I was told there's nothing we can do. To this day, I hear a cough, including my own, and it's a trigger. It's the sound, and I know it sounds crazy, but this is the effect of consistent mistreatment that really affects your mental health. It's like a dog that's been kicked and kicked around and maybe abused. Even when they go to a new and loving home, it takes a while before they begin to trust again. That's my story. Number seven, Joe Biden. Now this isn't related to politics. This again is another example of inhumane treatment, especially for someone who is enduring a serious health challenge like breast cancer. During the summer of 2019, Biden came to Wendy prior to the Democratic nomination, and I was told the night before by the news director and the assistant news director that they wanted me to conduct a one-on-one -on -one interview with Biden. Now, here's where the problems come into play. 
I was still under doctor's care and I was receiving immunotherapy treatments every other week. My body was deplete of normal energy, but I rallied and I continued to push through. Before I finish this part of the story, I want to say a quick aside here. I do regret the two years of working practically full time through chemo, radiation, and a year of immunotherapy treatments because I was exhausted. And yet I felt like I had to work because I didn't want management and my coworkers to use the trope that I was using my cancer diagnosis to not work because it affected their schedules. I knew that my absence would affect their work schedules, which was a constant complaint by coworkers, as told to me. But I heard it as well. This is a very real concern for anyone who gets sick, who has a disability, how your illness can be used against you in the workplace, and if management and coworkers want to use it against you, they do. And as we know, the bet was indeed connected to my real concerns of medical bias. That will be fully explained in a minute. But the bottom line, there was nothing I could have done to avoid their biased opinions of me. I overworked and I failed to place my own health as a priority. Back to Biden, I was told the night before his arrival that they wanted me to conduct the interview at the convention center. Now, I would have to arrive at 7 a.m. And mind you, I had just completed an immunotherapy treatment that morning and I went to work for my normal shift from 2 p.m. to 11.30 p.m. I got about four hours of sleep, and I made that quick turnaround for the next morning. So we sat there at the convention center for what seemed like an eternity. The interview continued to be pushed back, pushed back, pushed back, and I stayed in touch via email with my assistant news director as to the timing of when I would make it back to the station because I still had to anchor the 5 and the 6 and the 11. Well, six hours had passed, and finally the interview happened. And I was so tired, I was so weak, my bones were achy and hurty, hurting, but I actually powered through and I had to shoot some promos afterwards and I immediately sent an email to the assistant news director and I informed him that we were going to be kind of rolling in hot, if you will, so I could log the tape, write the story for the 5 p.m. broadcast and get ready for the 6. But I also asked to be excused from the 11 p.m. broadcast because I was exhausted. I was in pain and I literally could not work an 18 hour day on only four hours of sleep with my physical health the way that it was. He said he would talk to the news director. So the assistant ND wrote me back and said my request was denied. I asked why and he responded that the general manager didn't want the 11 p.m. to be solo anchored. He wanted two anchors. And I responded that it was impossible for me to physically do that. He said, well, you can go home after the 6 p.m. broadcast. Take a nap and come back to Anchor the 11. I have no words, and I still don't. The lack of compassion, much less understanding, literally floored me. When others have been out for their surgeries or illnesses, the red carpet was rolled out for them. I never complained about filling in for them. Oh, by the way, I did ask the GM if the solo anchor rule was indeed a mandate from him, and he said no. So either he was lying or the news director was lying. What could have been considered as a memorable brush with history to interview a presidential nominee who later became our president, it is now marred by the trauma, the traumatic treatment, which continued in number eight, the word harassment. A few months later, in January, February of 2020, I requested time off in March for spring break. And we had a new PTO request system. And according to the assistant news director, I would not be eligible for any vacation time until June of that year. Six months later, because he says I had taken so much time off for my cancer treatments. I was puzzled because the statement was false. In fact, all of my 2018 dates for chemo, surgery, radiation, they were planned and given to HR and the GM in writing ahead of time. My 2019 and early 2020 dates for my year-long immunotherapy treatments were also given to HR, the news director, and the general manager ahead of time. My treatments were every three to four weeks on a Wednesday, in the morning, early afternoon, and I would leave the hospital and I would go straight to work afterwards, arriving at 4 p.m. instead of 2. Now, there may have been two occasions over that time when I called out sick on the days of treatment, but I always worked, albeit very tired. I anchored all three shows, conducted interviews, produced stories without any assistance from producers. I did my job without skipping a beat. 
and viewers had no idea what was really going on behind the scenes. Over the course of a week, the assistant news director and I, we kept going back and forth about my schedule via email. And finally, I said, oh, we need to talk in person. So we did. We went inside a small conference room with the door closed, and he began to kind of ramble, talking in kind of uncompleted sentences while looking a little uneasy as he discussed the new PTO system. I could tell that he was a little rattled, but I didn't know why. And then he explained as to why that I would have to wait another six months before I can take a vacation. Because based on his dates, I quote, owe the station two days from being out sick. I'll never forget it. When I tell you I was floored, I literally sat there disgusted by his statement that I owed the station two days. What seemed like a silent prayer that lasted forever was about six, 10 seconds or so. I asked God to calm my spirit, help me remain unemotional, because I knew that I could not respond the way that I really felt. I finally said, let me tell you something. I don't know if you know, but I've been fighting for my life for the past two years. And your statement that I owe you two days is unconscionable. And quite frankly, it's harassment. What I effectively did was put them on notice. I said, I have, to bro I have a broadcast to prepare for. So I opened the door and I walked out. And no sooner had I sat at my desk, the general manager, the HR director, they walked by my desk almost immediately, joined the assistant news director in the news director's office. They closed the door. And guess what? I know they were talking likely about me. Now, I don't have the facts to back it up, but my spirit of discernment was soon affirmed. My last immunotherapy treatment was in March of 2020. I didn't work that day, but I returned on Thursday. I had a previously scheduled meeting with the general manager. And so when I went to the station that day at four, I walked to my desk. I said, hey to everybody, to the other anchors, the producers who were in front of me. And I said out loud, hey, everybody, I have to go upstairs to meet with the GM. I'll be right back. After I said that, I vividly remember seeing them all look at me like they were a deer caught in headlights, like they had seen a ghost. So I brushed it off and I went on upstairs. And I shared more of my concerns with the GM regarding the disparate treatment, the lack of communication still, the consistent lies from the news director as to why my stories weren't airing and more. And he said, I'm aware, just give me some more time. I remember that moment, just give me some more time. And I also remember God whispering to me saying, you're running out of time. Then the GM says, I heard what you said. Now he dare not repeat the word harassment, but that's what he was alluding to. I nodded my head and I looked him directly into his eyes. And I slowly and unequivocally responded. I said what I said. It was a moment that I will never ever forget. And then I said, I have to get ready for the show. You should know by now that I'm a straight shooter. I got my scarf, I flipped it around to my neck. And then I told him, I stood up and I said, your current management staff will be the downfall of this station. And I walked out. I closed the door behind me and I quickly went to the makeup room and the co-anchor was there. And the first thing she said was, I'm so surprised you're here. I thought you would have called out sick. Now the statement at the time seemed so weird and it was just really kind of out of nowhere. It was out of pocket. And I said, why would you think that? What I didn't know in that moment was that the reason why the staff was looking at me all quizzically when I informed them that I was going upstairs to meet with the GM, I believe they thought I had already heard about the bet and was going to talk to the GM about it. So the statement that she made was really a cover to pretend that she and the rest of the crew involved in the bet were really concerned about my health. But catch this. I didn't even know about their bet until almost two hours later while I was in the drive through line at Starbucks to get my chai tea latte when a co-worker called me and told me about the bet. So the next day in the makeup room before the show, more feigned concern for my health. Again, trying to manufacture care and compassion. But I've always known better. You see, I stood in the way of their main objective, which has been to diminish my presence and dare I say, eliminate me altogether. And I will say this, and it might sound harsh, but it's the truth. Dying from cancer would have been the easier way to achieve their goal. But God is using them for a greater purpose to shine a light on this pervasive issue of workplace bullying. 
Because if it can happen to me, it can happen to you. No one is immune. I'll share one more trigger word, and I will save the remaining eight moments, yes, there's more, for episode four, as all of them are solely related to upper management, including human resources. Now, you may be saying, Andrea, there's more? (laughs) Unfortunately, there's more. Everything that I'm sharing with you was part of the discovery process. They know it all. They have all the evidence. They've got everything because I have nothing to hide, but they do, which is why they all conspire to get their story straight, to band together, and I believe to even intimidate witnesses or even encourage them to stay silent. Some may have had other reasons as to why, but that's not my story to tell. But what I can tell you is that when the witnesses were asked for official statements and signed affidavits, they stayed silent. Again, for a future episode, but for now, here's the latest, or should I say the last trigger phrase that initiated my search for mental health because my spirit and my soul were literally broken. Number nine, car accident. When anyone says they were involved in a car accident or I see a story on the news about a car accident, there are times when it takes me back to 2019 when I was involved in a car accident a block away from the TV station. Since the cancer, I have experienced severe neuropathy. I still have issues in my hands and my feet. And one evening after the six o'clock broadcast, I went to grab something to eat nearby. And on the way back, I was approaching the light and I hit a car from behind. And I thought, I thought that I had been pushing the brake, but I was actually having a moment where I, I couldn't feel my feet and I didn't press the brake hard enough, so I hit the person in front of me. The sun was beginning to set. I was alone and I called my husband. He was in the middle of a school event with our son and he couldn't come. And he said, honey, call the station and see if someone can come out and help you. I kind of hemmed and hawed and I said, no, don't worry about it because in the evenings there aren't really a lot of people around the news station and I didn't want to bother anyone and take them away. So I called the police and they eventually came and I exchanged information with the person I hit and I even offered to give him a tour of the station someday because he recognized me as the TV lady. So I returned to the station, I sit down at my desk, and a coworker asks me if I'm okay, and I said, yeah, why? They said, well, we saw you at that car accident. I said, okay. They said, they asked the photographer to pull over to see if I needed help. They said the photographer refused to pull over because I, quote, was smiling and looked okay. And the person who told me was also visibly upset. And I just sat there as she's telling me the story and I was crying internally. I called my husband and I told him about the moment. And of course, I talked to my parents about it on the way home that night. And there was really no making sense of why my coworker wouldn't stop, why he chose to remain silent and just drive on by. What would it have cost him to simply roll down the window and ask if I needed help? Mind you, the police hadn't arrived on the scene yet, so I was still by myself with a stranger as darkness was beginning to shield the remaining light. Well, the next day I went to Human Resources and I told the one-person department, I told her what happened. I inquired about policy, our policy regarding duty to assist one another. I said, we work as teams, especially when we travel out of state, and I want to know, what is the company policy? And she said, there's no duty to act. While the most caring and compassionate action would have been to help, the company can't mandate respect and kindness. Although if you remember, I was told they trained the assistant news director on kindness after he mistakenly sent me the email between himself and other managers as they negatively talked about me. The HR person offered to broker a conversation between the photographer and myself so that I can share my feelings with him. I declined. I was scheduled to work with this photographer two days later for a special report on Saturday at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. I called the news director and I told him under no circumstances would I work with this photographer and to find a replacement. That photog never personally apologized to me. This moment and the aggregate of all of these moments that I have shared in the previous episodes and now this one, they broke me. My mental health was beyond suffering. I was emotionally dead. For someone to intentionally choose to abandon me was on another level. Had it been anyone else, I know he would have stopped. 
What was it about me that made him say, nah, she doesn't need any help. I know she's a co-worker, but she doesn't deserve to be extended a helping hand. While other anchors, reporters, weather people, they've been picked up from their homes during bad weather for flat tires or their car won't start. I couldn't even get a rolled down window and the calling of my name to see if I needed help. I was not given the benefit of my humanity. I immediately began searching for a therapist. We first met about a month later in June, and this scenario, because it had been the most recent, was the first situation I talked about as I was explaining the laundry list of unconscionable behaviors where I wasn't seen, where I wasn't heard, and I wasn't believed. She stopped me from talking, and she grabbed a tissue, and she began to cry with me for what seemed like an eternity. She said, this experience alone, coupled with fighting for my life with triple negative breast cancer, would be enough to break anyone. As I shared more of the egregiousness, she had more tears and at one point stopped me again and she thanked me for honoring my truth, for honoring my feelings and choosing to live because I should have been dead. Mental health is not a joke. How you treat people is the cornerstone of life. And working with people and for people who are intentionally, intentionally disrespecting you, intentionally treating you unfairly, and doing everything within their power to diminish your light, it was a living hell for me and my entire family and very close friends who've been privy to the traumatic experiences since the very beginning. Again, if this can happen to me, it can happen to anyone. Sadly, my story is but one of 76.3 million workers who are affected by workplace bullying. According to WorkplaceBullying.org, it also says 30% of adult Americans are bullied at work. 30%! And that number is growing. Imagine over 76 million people are victims of some form of discrimination, microaggressions, gaslighting, hostility, bullying, and more, all of which really fall under the umbrella of bullying. We as a society often talk about bullying as it relates to children, but this is a people problem. Bullying doesn't end when we become adults. People take their own, their own hurts, their anger, their insecurities, even their own trauma into the workplace, and they offend others. They need to do their work. They're the ones who need help. They need to change, and they need to grow. But more importantly, leaders need to hold people accountable and do the necessary work to eliminate the bad weeds that are choking the good seeds from growing and thriving. I was scheduled to begin this channel back in April, but my life took a turn for the better. After three years of walking away, after three years of being passed over and even denied the opportunity to work in the industry that I so love, even on the network level, being ghosted because people were afraid of my past, the past of me telling the truth, God opened doors that allowed me and allow me now to use my gifts and my talents combining all the things that I love to do from producing documentaries in the social justice arena and the ability to represent home decor brands on an international level. I'm finally thriving and I'm living my better than best life because I'm choosing who I work with and I'm so very grateful. And I want you to know that there's hope and a better life waiting for you too if you're currently in a work situation that doesn't honor and value you and respect your humanity. There's nothing I could have done differently. I was fighting to do my job. The onus was always on them, not on me, to hold people accountable and to create an environment where all of us can thrive. Words are useless when your actions don't back up what you say. After the George Floyd murder, the station created these promos that said, we're all in this together. I remember watching that and saying to myself, whatever. Because the reality is we weren't all in it together. All of us weren't treated fairly, and that's the truth. Working to mask the pain detrimentally affects your body and your soul. Your body is diseased. The mental pain is manifesting in physical pain and diseases, cancer, heart attacks, migraines, strokes, and more. In fact, studies show that workplace abuse has caused an increase in suicide ideation and suicide. Don't let someone else's decision to stay silent about workplace bullying prevent you from seeking help and speaking up for yourself and against the offenders. When people see and know abuse is taking place and they fail to report or stand by those who do, you're complicit in harboring bullies. 
I said it. There's no sugarcoating the truth. By the way, I recently found out that the former female co-anchor was given a management position when she was demoted from the 6 p.m. While my ascension to the 6 p.m. after 15 years garnered more work and no pay increase. It was duties as assigned. In the next episode, I'll share the last of the egregious behaviors and workplace bullying victims, more of them as well as experts to help us improve laws and hold employers accountable for failing to protect their employees. We're going to talk about solutions, solutions, solutions. And I will keep saying this until substantive changes are made. All of us can demand positive change and I will continue to serve in this advocacy role until it happens. As Rosa Parks says, you must never be fearful about what you're doing when it's right. We are on the side of right, and I look forward to working with you to end workplace bullying. Again, thank you for watching, liking, and subscribing to this channel, and please share it with others. And write me, info at mysilenceisnotforsale.com. I don't know who needs to hear this, but if no one else believes your experience, I do. I see you, and I hear you, and thriving is your birthright. Be well and share wellness.